Hello, everyone. I'm Happy Caldwell, and welcome to this edition of Arkansas Alive. All this week, I'm teaching about how to overcome fear. Stay tuned. You know, everything that we do, we have an opportunity to do it in faith or fear. Fear is what Satan uses to torment. Faith is the DNA of God. So if you're facing fear today, there are two ways for you to overcome fear, faith and love. Both of those will perfect you. Both of those will insulate you, you might say, from fear. Now let's pick up our story. Uh, yesterday we finished reading in Job chapter four. Well, we didn't actually get finished, but we're, we're talking about the manifestations of fear. And you can tell whether it's an angelic fear or an angelic reverence or a reverence to God. You know, the, the, the uh, shepherds were so afraid when an angel appeared to them. Uh, that's a healthy fear, a reverential fear of God. Um, Adam allowed the spirit of fear to come into the human race when he disobeyed God, ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He began to know evil. First thing that came out of his mouth was, I was afraid. So the difference between the spirit of fear, demonic, and, the, and fear, angelic, is the difference between where it's coming from. Now listen to Job here. And uh, this is Job. Well, you have to study the whole book of Job, and I have a complete teaching on Job, a story of faith that will help you. Oh, I thought Job was a story of suffering. No, suffering occurred, but that was not the story uh, of Job. Job's story was a story of faith, how after Satan's attack on him and he lost everything he had, God gave him back double, twice what he had before. So suffering occurred in Job, but that's not the story. The story is a story of faith. Okay, here, here's something that Job said. Fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Have you ever seen someone, or maybe you've experienced this yourself, where you were so afraid, so fearful, you started trembling. You started shaking. That don't... Don't ever allow anybody to do that. Don't, uh, don't ever scare somebody intentionally to the point where that fear comes in them because that, that's an, uh, an opening for a spirit of fear of the devil from the devil to come into you. Uh, Lester Summerall told me one time that he was over in Hawaii building TV stations <clears throat> and he went to bed at night and all of a sudden the, the spirit of the devil appeared to him in his room. And he said, you could sense it. You could feel the fear, the presence of the devil in the room. And he said, I knew who it was and I knew what he was there for. He was trying to intimidate me and cause me to fear about raising up these TV stations in Hawaii. In fact, he said, the, a voice spoke to me and said, I don't want you in these islands you get out of these islands. Don't you build any TV stations here? He said, I knew that was the devil. And he said, so I answered him back. Shut up. You don't have any authority over me. I'll build what God tells me to build. There's nothing you can do about it. Now you better get out of here because I'm going to sleep. And when I wake up in the morning, you better be gone. That's, <laughs> that's how Brother Summerall talked to the devil. Uh, he told me one time that he was overseas in a, in a, you know, one of these uh, uh, unindustrialized nations. They used to call them third world, third world countries, but he said it was very primitive. And he said he went to sleep and all of a sudden his bed moved six to eight inches out from the wall. It, it shook his bed, so it woke him up. And he said he knew it was demon spirits harassing him that had shoved his bed out from the wall. He said, so I just sat up and I said, put it back. And he said, the next morning when I woke up, the bed was back up against the wall. <laughs> the devil didn't mess with Brother Sumrall. The same with Smith Wigglesworth. And of course, Smith laid hands on Brother Sumrall before he died. 
So there was a boldness there. There was an understanding, a realization of uh, which kind of spirit it is and how to deal with it. But here's the manifestations. The spirit passed before me, my face, the hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image, did you get that? An image, uh, the marginal reference uh, refers to this as the spirit, the image met me. The spirit was before my eyes. There was a silence. I heard a still voice saying, did you get that? Uh, <clears throat> Brother Jesse Duplantis, I was talking to him on the phone the other night because I'd been checking on him uh, during the Hurricane Ida that hit New Orleans. And, uh, and so we had uh, uh, not been able to reach him for a while because all the phone service was out. But after I knew it had been restored, I called him. And I said, Brother Jesse, I said, I want to make sure you and Kathy are all right. And of course, we had, we had sent them an offering to help them financially in any area that they needed. And I, I said, I just want to make sure you're okay. He said, you know, let me tell you what happened. He said, when that hurricane hit New Orleans, and I've been in his home several times, and I know uh, it's right on the river. It's right on the Mississippi River. The levee's on in front of his house, and the river's on the other side. So I knew that this was quite severe. But I know that he built his home to, to withstand hurricane speed winds. But the, the, the storms, but the winds were more than what anybody expected, and it blew off some roofs and shingles and so forth. He said, I went outside to talk to the devil and to tell him to stop this destruction. He said, and Kathy told me, don't go out there. You could be killed. And Jesse said, I went out there anyway. And their house is built in kind of a horseshoe shape with a, a not a garden, but a, a area in between in the, in the middle of the horseshoe a patio. A lot of homes in New Orleans have those uh, patios. And <clears throat> he said, I got out there and I got in between the, the, the bricks in the corner of my courtyard. And he said, and I began to talk to that storm. And he said, I heard a voice. He said, the devil told me he was going to kill me. That's what he said. He said, I'm going to kill you. And of course, Jesse answered him back and said, you can't kill me. My life is hid in Christ. <clears throat> and he responded, affirmatively or positively <coughs> according to the word of God. But just like this happened to Job, he said, this spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. I stood, it, I, it stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before my eyes. There was silence and I heard a voice saying, the Mars of Reverence says, I heard a still voice. Same thing that, that Satan uh, tried to do with Jesse. And, and of course, he was not killed and his home was not destroyed. But you have to learn to discern these things. Notice it said, um, I discerned, uh, another scripture verse, I discerned uh, this spirit that passed my face and I, d I could not discern the form thereof, but the image was there. And I discerned, he knew it was the devil. And so he spoke to it. He addressed it. You have to do that. If fear comes on you to this degree, um, I don't know. I kind of doubt that any of you have maybe had this experience. Maybe you have. But I think m more than likely the normal individual, the normal Christian just has to battle with thoughts of fear. I don't think many people have ever seen or heard a spirit of fear or the spirit of the devil talk to them directly. But you have to deal with imaginations. You have to deal with thoughts of fear. Uh, whenever you're doing anything, 
uh, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he, he likes to get you to fear uh, so he can get you involved in what he wants you to do. And if you start fearing, the time to deal with it is immediately. The, the moment you discern what it is, you, you come against that spirit of fear. No, I'm not, I'm not taking you. I, re, I rebuke the spirit of fear. You have no part or lot in me. I give you no place in my life. Then you start quoting the Word of God. Because if the spirit of fear can get a toehold or a stranglehold on you, he will get you to help him bring what you're fearing to pass. People have, have in stark terror um, actually helped the devil. I remember years ago, there was a, a couple of friends of mine, businessmen and church members, uh, Christians, and they were in business together. And I remember uh, one of them was in the insurance business. The other one owned retail stores. And I remember this tornado was coming and this one brother, I knew him pretty well, but he had, he had all kind of physical conditions. He had heart problems. He'd had heart attacks, heart surgery, et cetera. And when that tornado started coming, he got in his car and drove down Interstate 30. He was going to outrun this tornado. And he, he got in his car here in Little Rock and went towards Benton. And he got under one of these overpasses to avoid the tornado and was so fearful. He was so afraid. He acted all this out in fear. He had a heart attack and died right there in his car under the bridge. What Satan did was drive him with that spirit of fear. I'm going to blow your house down. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to wreck your car, whatever. And he got in that car and for fear, he drove trying to outrun uh, that tornado and had a heart attack and died. So don't ever act on fear. Don't ever act on what you're fearing. <laughs> if you're fearing something, get in the word, begin to praise God, begin to quote Psalm 91 and act positively against that fear. Let it know that it is not welcome in your life. You're not going to give place to it and to get out of your life. Okay, let's go over to um, Mark chapter 4. Look, we're looking at manifestations of fear. Let's go to Mark chapter 4. Very interesting passage of Scripture in verse 37. And there arose a great storm of wind. And it beat into the ship so that it was now full. Now, I've already told you my hurricane story of riding out a, a, a hurricane in a, a U.S. naval destroyer. And uh, Jesus uh, was asleep in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest not that we perish? We're dying here, Jesus. What? We need some help here. And Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. That's, the, that's not the norm that God created you for. He didn't create weather to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus said, Peace. He spoke peace to the storm. And he said, Be quiet. That's, that's when he said there was a great calm uh, Rick Renner did an exhaustive study on it in the Greek, and he said what Jesus said was, shh. We do that to little children, to babies, to get them to go to sleep, to calm down. Shh. That's what Jesus said to the storm. Peace. Be still. That's not what God created you for. Go back to the original reason that God created you for, which was to water the earth and pollinate, etc. And so it, all of a sudden, there was a great calm. I like what King Philip used to say to Queen Elizabeth. Uh, excuse me, Prince Philip. Uh, Prince Philip was Queen Elizabeth's husband for many, many years. She's still living in her mid-90s. He died a few months ago. And uh, they asked her in an interview, said, uh, you know, are you going to miss Prince Philip? Well, that's a dumb question to ask somebody that's been married <laughs> 60 years. And she said, well, of course. She said, well, what was he to you? Meaning, 
How was he? What are you going to miss? How was he? She said, he was my rock. Now, the Queen Elizabeth is a pretty stable lady. I mean, as a young girl, she became Queen of England and she fought, she worked in, with the military in World War II. She was a mechanic uh, in, in the army. And so uh, she said, uh, Prince Philip was my rock. She said, anytime we had a situation where there was a challenge, a fear, a war or whatever, his response was always be calm and carry on. That's so British. Be calm and carry on. I love it. I can just hear, hear him saying that. Well, that's what Jesus said <coughs> to the storm. He said, peace, be quiet. And there was a great calm and the wind ceased. There was a great calm. And he said to them, listen to this. Why are you so fearful? What are you afraid of? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Faith will deliver you from the effects of fear. How is it that you have no faith? Faith, what's faith to, got to do with it? Faith in God. Faith in His Word. Faith in what He said to you. And you may have heard me tell this story when Jeannie and I were in a car accident. My goodness, it's probably been it was 1988. I'll show you how long ago that was, 30 years, over 30 years. And, it, and the, uh, actually a big tire truck hit us from the rear, knocked a car 30, 40 feet, knocked our shoes off, uh, broke the seats in the car, and broke Jeannie's back in three places. And, of course, they immediately wanted to do surgery. Took her to the emergency room. We've got to do surgery. We've got to do surgery. We're going to put three rods in your back the size of this pencil. And she said, no. <laughs> she said, no. I don't, I'm not paralyzed now, and I don't want you cutting on my back. And she said this. She said, God loves me, and God is my healer. Take that, devil. God loves me, and God is my healer. That was a revelation that she had, and God did heal her. She didn't have the surgery. She didn't have any rods put in her back, and she recovered supernaturally, but it was because she knew God loved her, and she knew God would heal her. So you have to know that. You, you can't doubt. You can't have fear. <clears throat> well, I'm afraid this. Well, I'm afraid of that. Well, I'm afraid, I'm afraid we can't go to that meeting. Why not? What are you afraid of? Well, I'm feared. I'm afeared. <laughs> I'm afeared we'll get down there and get stuck. I'm afeared our car won't make it. I'm afraid this. I'm afraid that. And we re in, 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 um, invent and uh, reinforce what the devil is trying to, to do to us. Now, there's a difference between the spirit of fear and fear and, and caution. You don't do dumb things. You don't do stupid things. I mean, you know... I pastored for 37 years and you can learn a few things just by stumbling over them in 37 years. But I remember when uh, Charles Capps and I were teaching faith in our church. We had an inner city church at that time in the early 70s. And there was this guy in our church. He had heard Charles talk about confession brings possession and, and speaking to the mountain. And Charles had a great revelation of of faith and confession. And so uh, Charles told a story about how he was flying home. He flew his own airplane. He'd been flying as a farmer for years and he had an um, airstrip right behind his house. And you just land in the cotton field, soybean field, whatever, and then he'd pull into his hangar. And he was flying home from a meeting one time and uh, the headwinds uh, had created such a uh, resistance against him that he had used more fuel than he should have because of the headwinds. And so when he got ready to land, he was about em on empty and he prayed and asked God to multiply his gasoline so he could get home and land safely. And God did. They found out after he landed, they went and measured the fuel in the wing and he had... <laughs> He had more fuel than he needed. And so this guy heard this 
in the church. Charles gave that story. This guy heard this and he said, I'm going to try that on the way home. I'm going to do what? I'm going to try that on the way home. What do you mean? Now, I heard this testimony later is the only reason I'm able to tell you. This guy got in his car and he had a tank full of gas. He, he, he had gas in his car. I'm sorry. He did not have a, a, a full tank of gas. His gas tank was on empty. And so rather than go to a service station and get some gas, he said, I'm going to try this, what he said, on the way home. I just believe I have a tank full of gas. I just believe I have a tank full of gas. He was going to prove that his faith and confession was going to multiply his gasoline because it multiplied Charles and the airplane so he can multiply mine. He had money in his pocket to buy gas. He passed several gas stations on the way home, but he was going to get home without getting gas and he was going to get home on his faith. And he ran out of gas and had to call somebody to come get him. <laughs> That's not faith. That's foolishness. That's presumption. So there's a difference between being in a situation where you have to exercise your faith and being in a situation where you should exercise good sense or good judgment. I remember Dodie Osteen, Joel Osteen's mother, and she's still living. And of course, Jeannie and I knew John and Dodie for years, and, and uh, Dodie got uh, a diagnosis of cancer. This was many years ago. And so she went to the doctor, the MD Anderson Cancer Clinic is there in Houston. So she went to the doctor, and the doctor told uh, she and John, she said, you know, there's nothing we can do for you. This cancer is inoperable. So John said, well, good, then we're going home. What are you going to do? We're going to believe God. And they believed God and made confessions and they did everything they knew to do in their spirit for her healing and God healed her and she was healed. A few years later, the cancer came back. And so John took her back to the clinic and the clinic said, well, uh, the situation has changed now. Uh, we can operate and we can do surgery and remove this cancer. And the Lord told John, said, let them operate and remove the cancer. Now, the first time they said there was nothing they could do. And so they believed God and God healed. The second time God told them, go have the operation, go have the surgery. Well, their faith is in God. Their faith is in what God says and what God said. So they did what God said and she was healed. She's still healed today. I saw her a few years ago at one of Joel's meetings. So the issue is not whether you have surgery or don't have surgery, whether you go to the doctor or don't go to the doctor. The, the, the issue is whether you, whether you believe God or not. And God can tell you to go to the hospital or go to the doctor or have an operation. And if you do that, you're in obedience and you, the results will be the same. So there's, there's no premium. Ignorance is not a premium or denial. You know, a lot of people deny medical science and whatever for fear. You may have heard me tell the story about a lady in our church. She had a wreck down on Markham Street right in front of the UAMS. She wouldn't get in the ambulance and go to the emergency room. And they called me. I was her pastor. And so I went down there and I said, Charlotte, what's the problem here? Why won't you get in the ambulance and go to the emergency room? She said, oh, I can't do that. That wouldn't be faith. She didn't say it that way, but that's what she was doing. I said, Charlotte, don't, don't lay here in the bleed all over the street. Get in the ambulance and go to the emergency room. I'll go with you. And long story short, what it turned out was she didn't have the money to pay for the emergency services. And so she was afraid. She was afraid of doctors. She was afraid she didn't have the money. So I said, don't let that bother. We'll pay, we'll pay for the emergency room and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they sold her up whatever it needed to be done. And she went on her way fine. Sometimes we are fearful of things. And sometimes we don't use wisdom. We're not cautious and we're afraid. And <clears throat> Jesus said to them, how is it that you have no faith? Faith moves mountains. Jesus talked to trees. He talked to the wind. He talked to the sea. 
So faith is how you overcome fear. But you've got to know the Word. You've got to know the truth. Now, if you've got an old rickety car that just barely gets across the street, you don't want to drive that to California. I mean, you don't want to, you know, <laughs> start off on a two or three day trip. Go get the battery checked, the, you know, the engine checked, the tires checked. I mean, do whatever you need to do. Replace the ball tires. That's not fear. That's faith in action. There's a difference between faith in action and foolishness and presumption. But I've had issues out on the highway because we traveled for years. In fact, we were coming from Wyoming, going driving down to Louisiana, and we got to the Kansas-Colorado border, and our engine blew up. And, you know, I called myself living by faith. I called myself, well, I carried a toolbox in the back of the van. I was going to take care of the situation. But the Lord told me before we even left on the trip, you need to trade that van in. Oh, I didn't have the money to do that. And I didn't want to do it. So I just said, I'm going to go by faith. And we went. And we wound up on the side of the road, stranded in a hotel for three days till we could get a new, new van. That's not faith. That's foolishness. And you don't want to get into fear because fear brings on the disaster that you're trying to uh, eliminate. Oh, I can't tithe, Pastor Caldwell. I've told my pastor I can't tithe because I'm afraid I won't have enough money left. Well, if fear is your motivation, you're right. You're not going to have enough money left. But if you do it in faith, believe in God, God's going to take care of you. Now, tomorrow we're going to talk about the next uh, way to overcome fear, and that's love. 1 John 4, it talks about the love of God. And he says, if you, if you have fear and it's tormenting you, you're not perfected in the love of God. So you join me tomorrow because we're going to deal with this. This is a great revelation. If you ever laid in bed at night and fear thoughts come to you and you're tormented in your mind, that's fear. And you need to know that God loves you and you are perfected in love by loving God and loving people. And if you do that and you continue to walk in that, you can even in your dreams, even in your sleep, you can rebuke the spirit of fear. Jump in tomorrow. Remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas 72221 or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at vtntv.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at vtntv.com.